The U.S. is ramping up its evacuation efforts in Afghanistan following a deadly blast in Kabul. An offshoot of ISIS known as ISIS-K has claimed responsibility. Dozens of Afghans and 13 U.S. service members were killed, including 11 Marines. This all comes just days before President Biden's deadline to withdraw all U.S. forces from the country. For more now, I want to bring in CBS News senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe. Ed is moderating this Sunday's Face the Nation. Ed, what is ISIS-K and what is the latest on the administration's response to the group's attacks? Sure. Well, the, the latest response from the White House is that it could happen again. There was a pretty stern warning from the White House issued shortly after the president and vice president got a briefing in a situation room from top military, diplomatic and national security officials saying essentially that what happened on Thursday could happen again before Tuesday's deadline when U.S. military forces are supposed to get out. ISIS-K is the Afghan version or affiliate of ISIS, the organization that, of course, has caused terrorist attacks all over the world. In some cases, they have... Uh, uh, you know, recruited disaffected Taliban members, and they are by no means a partner of the Taliban. They are widely considered to be a rival group uh, trying to influence or get power of Afghanistan, as Islamist fighters all over the world now realize that the country is essentially up for grabs or potentially a, a much more fertile ground for them to live, work, and potentially plot attacks not only in that country, but around the world. So it remains a big concern. And, of course, a lot of questions about what exactly the United States is going to be able to do in terms of stopping them from committing more violence in Afghanistan or outside the country once the U.S. military pulls out. And, Ed, you'll be speaking with Republican Senator Lindsey Graham on the withdrawal and our future relationship with Afghanistan. Uh, he was, in many ways, an ally of President Trump's, but differed with him on the drawdown. How likely is it that President Biden will take cues from Congress moving forward? And what else are you hoping to hear from the senator? Oh, about as likely as the sun coming up in the east and or in, or in the west and setting in the east, or you know something like that. Not going to happen. Uh, they differ completely on the issue of what to do about Afghanistan today. The senator and a few other Republicans endorsing an idea of essentially scooping up a bunch of former Afghan government officials who stayed in the country and have relocated to another part, and having the U.S. recognize them as the provisional government that would stand against the Taliban and try to take control of the country. And in so doing, the U.S. should keep behind military forces, Senator Graham said, to try to help them out. That is exactly what the president says he's not going to do. The U.S. military is planning to get out on Tuesday. It will not maintain the presence as it has for the last 20 years anymore after that. And any kind of military operation that gets carried out from Afghanistan or in Afghanistan will originate outside the country. At least that's the current strategy and plan. Uh, and if it was to occur, it would be some kind of counterterrorism move to stop some kind of imminent threat. So big disagreements between, in this case, Senator Graham and the president. Uh, and there are disagreements uh, among other Republicans and Democrats with the White House about how this withdrawal has been conducted and what exactly the United States should have been doing instead in Afghanistan. And maybe it's uh, maybe it's so unlikely that instead of east and west, it just entirely switches sides and the sun starts rising in the north and setting in the south. There you but, go. That uh, would have been easier. But I hear you. I, <laughs> I hear you on unlikely, unlikely to be calling the shots on this one. Uh, let's let's change pace a little bit and talk about COVID because cases are still surging throughout the country. What can we expect you and former FDA commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb to discuss this Sunday? Schools and whether or not students should be in schools wearing masks, not wearing masks around uh, educators who are vaccinated or unvaccinated. I mean, this is the debate du jour. Alana, you and I have kids. We're thinking about this as the school year begins. Mm -hmm. It is a big concern for parents all across the country, especially amid reports that there are thousands of students in places like Atlanta who are at home right now quarantining because educators that were working in their schools got sick. And so the kids had to be set, get sent home. In some cases, these school districts had virtual learning plans. In others, they don't. So what are the kids to do? It's going to cause incredible disruption yet again for the second consecutive school year. Guys like Dr. Gottlieb, who used to lead the FDA, consult a lot of public and private sector entities about what to do about the pandemic, what's the right scientific response. So we'll talk to him a little bit about that and uh, get his sense of how much longer the Delta variant is going to be ravaging the country and causing so many more deaths. 
I'm also interested in getting your take on the Florida state judge's ruling on Friday that Governor Ron DeSantis's ban on school mask mandates is illegal. That decision is, of course, expected to be appealed. What ultimately led to this ruling? And do you think that this case eventually might make it to the Supreme Court? Well, we'll see. It's going to the Florida Supreme Court next, because this was a lower court ruling there in the state. And essentially, the judge said that the governor can't be implementing a rule that blocks school districts from implementing uh, a mask mandate if they decide to do so, because there are actually public health reasons why a local school district should be able to do that. This is a debate that will play out legally and politically. The, the governor knew what he was doing when he picked this fight. He's trying to win over and, and keep happy a certain segment of the Florida voting population and, frankly, the broader Republican voting base across the country as he thinks about his own national political ambitions. And we'll see ultimately where this case leads. But we have seen, at least at the federal level with the U.S. Supreme Court, an eagerness to allow locally enforced public health mandates to stand, but in, it, unless it, it infringes on something like religious beliefs. For example, they tossed out a, a New York ruling uh, related to churches in that state. So we'll see if it ever gets to the U.S. Supreme Court and what they would say about this. And it's likely that you're going to see similar legal fights in places like Georgia or Arizona uh, and, and other states that have implemented these kinds of mandates and where there's disagreement at the local and the state level about how exactly schools should be addressing the pandemic. And you're absolutely right that it, it keeps Governor DeSantis's name on, name on the tongues of all of us uh, journalists and, and across the country, people paying attention to what he's doing there. Uh, finally, Ed, Republicans in the Texas House of Representatives passed their restrictive voting rights legislation late Thursday night. It comes after more than 50 state Democratic lawmakers fled to Washington last month to try and block the bill from being passed. So what happens next? What happens next is this bill goes back to the Texas State Senate to approve some modest changes to it, and then it's on to the governor for a signature. This was always expected once Democrats acquiesced and got back to work in Austin, as they decided to do in the past week, uh, because of the Republican majorities in both legislatures and the fact that they hold the governor's office, uh, this bill is going through. It does, among other things things end the drive-through and 24-hour voting option that existed in Harris County, Texas, which encompasses Houston, that was put in place last fall as a public health response to the pandemic. Democrats argue they should have been allowed to continue to do that and that local officials should have been able to set the rules. Republicans turn around and say, no, we've got to have uniform rules across the state. And while Harris County may have been able to do 24-hour or drive-through voting, other states in the, in the or other counties in the state didn't have the resources to do it, therefore we can't allow for it. Democrats obviously will fight this in the courts. They'll continue to talk about it politically as well. Uh, and this fight is not much different than what we've seen in Florida, in Georgia, in Iowa, and in other states that are Republican controlled and are still responding to last November's election results. Always good when I get to spend a little bit of time with you, Ed. I'm looking forward to seeing Face the Nation this weekend. Well, I'm Thanks. glad you are. Please, everyone else, tune in as well or watch the repeats here on CBSN all afternoon Sunday. You know what? I'll tell everybody about that right now. Face there the Nation, in fact, streams every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern on CBS and later at 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. right here on CBSN.